Hi, welcome to this week's GMB and Tech Show. What we got coming up this week? Well, we've got the DV8 High Pivot XC bike. Ooh, we have. And we've got the Victoria Race Compound tyres. Yep, and Suntour Tact Suspension. We'll be talking about that in the news. And we've got some really cool rewind entries. <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny at all, is it? No. So on the downhill World Cup circuit, there's been quite a lot of prototypes, which is nice to see again. You know, we're getting back into that phase where mm. things are being like, you know, seen for the first time on in the actual racing. And uh, Pivot is obviously one of them. And while our guys were out in uh, Lear Gang, we managed to get some footage of it up close. So uh, you can have a look at that on screen now. And it does look gorgeous. And there's a lot going on on it, which makes me wonder, is this something we should be looking at as a view to the future downhill bikes like what can we learn from this bike that is going to be what we're buying in a year or two's time um, now obviously we've got this sort of high pivot ish design um, we can see the idler there and that makes you think high pivot straight away but actually uh, it's what they're calling a dw6 at the moment um, because it's the dave weagle link you know famous um, designer of linkages what else has he done um, hip-hop hip hip sandal wearing enthusiast Oh, right, okay, yeah, that is yeah. what he's famous for. Oh, DW Link is his thing, a split pivot. Yeah, um, and he's things. designed the one on Evil, hasn't he? Before, That's right, Delta think, Linkage. Yeah. Yeah, he's done loads of stuff, he's awesome. Exactly. Um, and it is not, but it's not a traditional high pivot. So although they call it a DW6, in fact, it's like a five bar linkage system <laughs> with a flex stay. Uh, so maybe it's like a five DW5.2. Five, maybe. <laughs> uh, but it does have the characteristics of a six bar and it has a slightly rearward axle puff, um, but it doesn't have the sort of negative benefits of the, the high pivot. So you get that rearward, um, but you you know you can pump it a bit better i'm i'm told it's a bit more efficient um over the high pivot um so yeah we're still sort of on that sort of high pivot trend i guess but also there's a lot of adjustments in it so there's chain stay adjustment adjustments there's also the shot can be mounted in different places and then there's the headset reach or angle adjusters but i think this is something that is definitely coming through into the finished market i don't think this is a prototype thing what do you think no i, I think you're right i think there's, I mean, in addition to this, there's, there's other brands that are doing stuff at the moment, and it seems to be, I mean, adjustment's always been the thing with down mm. bikes, uh, but it's kind of, from a consumer perspective, it's kind of gone away a little bit. You might have a flip chip or something to adjust your BB height, but yeah. an amount of adjustment to adjust the progression on the suspension and your chainstay lengths and your bottom bracket height, so mm. like a number of different things on one chassis. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on. And it seems great for downhill because obviously they're very specialist bikes and sometimes they can be too specialist on a type of rider, like who's riding on the World Cup scene or a particular type of course, but with the adjustments, well, you can adjust it to what type of rider you like or uh, what style of rider you are, uh, which I think is a great idea. Um, but going back to the prototype, uh, obviously we can see that it's lugged by these sort of machined aluminium lugs and the carbon in between. Um, and we're told that that's not going to be a finished product, it's not going to end up looking like an Atherton bike as such. Well, I don't think it does, um, I think it looks like an old GT Lobo. <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I, I like the Lobos. <laughs> uh, here's a Lobo on the screen, what do you reckon? Does it look like a pivot? Maybe. Mm -hmm. but, uh, oh, sorry, how, how reliable were they? Uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently Wolf Tooth have been involved in a lot of the machining. I don't think they've been doing the aluminium lugs because uh, they're machined, um, but they have been making a lot of custom chain rings. So you can see obviously the idler is different. Um, they're doing that for more chain wrap. Um, I would think that's a good thing from a um, post like a, um, a normal person buying a bike's point of view because of the reliability you're less Definitely. likely to sort of Lose break idler teeth and stuff like that do you mm. think the downhill world cuppers are doing that from a reliability point of view or is there oh. more benefits in um like better chain wrap for well you want to reduce the friction as much as possible right. yes but chain wrap definitely i mean some of the earlier high pivot bikes were losing chains quite a lot right. just because you think there's physically less chain on your main chain ring than if it wraps all the way around so yeah that's that's obviously a good thing yeah i mean i'm just looking through this shot so it's an awesome looking bike yeah. it? but it's funny that whole dw6 thing because I mean, it, it is essentially still just a DW linkage above the BB that you can see in that rocker, and then there's just another link to support the movement of the back end there. I mean, 
kind of is still yeah. six. But and apparently that idle is adjustable to adjust that chain tension because obviously it's got two chains. Yeah. And you can see that the chain rings are kind of custom anyway, and they've swapped around a lot of different ones recently, uh, thanks to Wolf Tooth basically just flying them in every week so that they can try out different things. So uh, that's really exciting. It looks like a standard derailleur to me, but if you look at the discs, um, those rotors, the fins are slightly different, and we did chat to the mechanic on Tane's uh, tent who did confirm that there is some new fin tech potentially coming through on those uh, ice tech rotors. So watch this space. Is there going to be a new downhill um, group set or braking system from Shimano or just a little bit of tweaks? Don't know. Mm, yeah, it does feel like about time for something like that to sort of... Yeah, I would say so. Mm. And then the only thing I would pick out that was quite interesting was the saddle. It's a gravel saddle <laughs> from WTB. Oh, of course you'd pick out the flipping yeah, gravel saddle. Yeah, it's a gravel saddle. saddle. But apparently it's so <laughs> tiny that all the downhill racers really like that So because it Makes obviously sense. stays out of the way. It's yeah. got a short back end. And even Tane, the saddle that she's running, is actually a custom, and she had to have it custom made for her so that it was narrow enough to stay out of the way. So I feel like we need to start thinking about downhill specific saddles in the near future because there's not much, not much tech going on in that field, really. Um, but yeah, anyway, what do you think? What do you think? Do you like the look of it? I love the it look of the bike. Out? Yeah, I, I, I think it should, as it is, to be honest, as it looks. So I could see that for a consumer perspective, it would cost a fortune to, <laughs> to, to buy a bike like mm. that. I mean, it's not going to be cheap anyway, but... Um, no, yeah. it's a pivot at the I'd, end of the I'd day. rather it was on sale like it is. I think it's amazing. Yeah, well, I'm excited to see what they do with that in potentially a year's time. But anyway, let us know down in the comments below, what do you think of the pivot prototype? If this was a finished carbon product with the two chains, would you be interested? Would you be all about that? Uh, let us know down in the comments below. Okay, into news then, and more suspension talk. So we're going to talk about the Suntour TACT system, so TA, uh, not T-A-C-T, I don't know actually what that stands for, it doesn't say on their website. Uh, it seems to be causing a bit of a stir, especially seeing as it looks a bit more refined that you might have seen on some of the bike checks recently on the channels. Um, it, it looks really cool, it's obviously highly proven already, because even at the very early prototyping stage, Tom Pidcock won the Olympic gold one. I think he's had yeah, four UCI World Cup wins on this system already. So in case you're not aware, um, we're going by the stats that are now on the Suntour website. In fact, here's a little screen grab here of the site. There is some official information, but it does say more info soon. It's not like commercially, you can't actually buy this stuff yet, but they're just getting sort of ramping up for it. But it appears to work in a similar vein to uh, Fox Live Valve and Flight Attendant from SRAM and RockShox uh, in the fact that it's got accelerometers and things in the bike. In fact, they, they say it's got a standalone uh, sensor, single sensor for front and rear suspension with a four millisecond read and write time on there. So it makes a decision and it makes adjustments to the suspension in that amount of time. And it, uh, the accelerometers differ from motions and bump force against the rider and the input force. So there's a lot of intelligent stuff going on there. Now the ones we've seen on Pidcock's bike, which you can hopefully see on screen, and Pauline Ferran Barai's bike, don't appear to have a battery on them at all, which looks quite neat. You can see a cable going into, into the frame itself. Now on their website, they do have a bottle cage that has the battery mounted onto there. So I can only think that on their bikes, they've got some kind of internally routed one. It has a USB-C charging system and uh, it's got open, medium and firm settings. There's an app as well, as you can see, there's a screen grab here that says Android and iOS compatible, Bluetooth, and it's got eight adjustment levels. Do you know what? I think it's really nice to have another major player, especially in cross country, I think, at the moment, where there's so much going on. I think I don't I don't think cross country's ever been this exciting. The courses, yeah. the level of the riders, and in addition to Fox and Rock Joyce, you've now got Suntour and they're right up there. I reckon this system is going to be really, really good. Mm, prototypes on the XC scene again. Yeah. It's like, yes, very exciting. Well, and, and also, we, we mentioned it the other day that we'd spotted, in fact, everyone spotted it, Nino Scherter running what appears to be flight mm. attendant for cross country. Now, I was on a product launch recently. That was not one of those products, by the way. Um, we were, basically, all the journalists there were asking, like, when's it coming out? And they were like, it ain't coming this year. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> well go. in advance so then, it does prototypes. exist but Nino's being the, the test mule for it at the moment I'd imagine you might see it on some other pros bikes at some point soon hmm. so speaking of prototypes more prototypes obviously we love them here um, is Luckland Blair has been spotted racing the downhill world cup or at least trying to qualify for uh, on a dv8 bike now we know he rides enduro for dv8 um, but this has obviously got triple crank 
triple clamp forks or a double crown, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> um, but basically, I did speak to the designer at DVA and was like, what's this all about? Is this a new downhill bike coming? And he said that they've used the Claymore layup, uh, sorry, the Claymore molds, but they've used a different carbon layup to make it a lot stiffer. So it is based on their enduro race bike, uh, but a lot stiffer and a slightly different linkage. And he said that they're just mucking around at the moment to try and learn <laughs> some stuff and they think it's quite fun. Um, <laughs> he said it was a fun opportunity uh, to send the guys to the World Cup. Wow. Uh, also, another bit of a learning experience is this. If you've come here for this thumbnail, well, I'm going to finally talk about it. It's the uh, DV8 Fairbrother, um, also affectionately known as the Lowlander or Project Lowlander. The Lowlander. Uh, because oh, right. you've got to love that, <laughs> Presumably because it's a low travel or a shorter travel yeah. Highlander, which was their sort of trail bike. Um, oh. But they've gone for the high pivot here, um, but it's a downcountry bike. So we're looking at 125 mils in the rear and 140 up front. Oh, that's not downcountry, um, that's trail. <laughs> Come on, DVA. Well, I, mean, I don't if it's know. Over 120 years, Not if it's a high pivot. Well, maybe it's actually, a magic yeah, number. You're right. You're right. You're it is, right. It's, it's probably a it trail bike. Insanely <laughs> nice. It's so good, and obviously it's a majority titanium wow. frame here, but yeah. it's got a carbon fiber seat tube, as you can see. Um, now, the the way that they've got this sort of clean look is obviously you can see a lot of straight tubing, so there's tight tubing there, but they've got the. Uh, it's not so much lugs. They've cold metal forged. Um, all the complicated areas so that the tubes can uh, be bonded and well or the carbon tube can be uh, shoved in there as well <laughs> so it's slightly it's got a slightly different finish to it when you look at sort of the Atherton's which has yeah. um, a metal sintering process on their lugs these guys have gone cold metal fusion uh, which gives a sort of a nicer smoother finish we've seen this before on Hoon cycles um, mm. if you saw the handmade bike um, video that I did last year uh, do check out the bespoke video if you're into that sort of stuff and they go into a bit more detail about why they're choosing it but effectively they uh, deviate saying this is a learning process because cold metal fusion um, can be done in the UK uh, it's quicker and it has it's less labor intensive than the laser metal sintering that we see the Atherton's using so it should be effectively cheaper in terms of labor and material costs you won't have the shipment over and apparently that carbon tube is um, like a nylon thermo plastic rather than a thermo set so that's cleaner uh, as well and also quicker to create and it's recyclable so they're basically trying this out in order to see if it's viable to make tie frames um, that are just as affordable as their carbon frames currently which they're shipping from Asia so uh, I guess it's question would you buy a titanium 3D printed Enduro bike if it costs the same as a carbon one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I heart, think mate. I would. 100% um, tie is rad. <laughs> if they can get the price of those frames down to around about three, three and a half uh, grand or US dollars actually, um, then they're going to make it work. So oh, keep an eye do. on that, basically. Lovely. Um, <laughs> right, under this table, I'm just going to grab them. We've got some of the new Vittoria tyres. So I'm sure you've been aware that we've been using Vittoria tyres for a while. Uh, they've got the Martello, the Mazza and the Motor. Uh, this isn't about the tyre treads as such, it's more the race compound they're now available in. So previously they've got their four compound system which no other tyre manufacturer can actually offer, which essentially means they're insanely grippy but they roll really well and they're great all-rounders. But some of the top racers wanted something a bit softer, basically for race-only conditions. So these new ones are single compound only, they're a 60 TPI casing, like the current Enduro tyres, but they also have increased puncture resistance on the main tread there, which you all love, because you love a puncture, don't you? <laughs> um, so they're, they're offering them the Mazza in a 2.4 and a 2.6, the Motor in the 2.4, and the Martello in a 2.4 and a 2.6, and then you can get the options in 27.5 and 29 inch. Now, the cool thing about these, if I get my little rubber gerometer tester out, oh, you you've got to bear thing. in mind that it is kind of difficult to get a, a, an accurate reading when a tyre is like this. But on here, just plugging this thing in, what I'm getting at is, I mean, I could say it's between 40 and 42A, all right? So just to put that into perspective, their regular tyres are about, if you're measuring on the side lugs, you're talking about 52. 
uh, but actually with the way the design of the tyre works, they feel softer in use, but they roll harder. These ones are incredibly soft, so these are maximum grip, but they've, they've still got the graphene infused in them, which, here's a shot, in fact, of my rear tyre that's not the race compound, the regular 4C that's got graphene in it. It's over a year old, um, and it's, it's astonishing how well that particular one is lasting, and I think this is something that comes up quite a lot. Um, now the 40 and 40A, whatever it is between them, so super tacky tyres from Maxxis are 42A, and the old slow Rizes, which is probably the softest ever, were about 40, that's what these are like. Um, awesome stuff, they're available now, basically. And there's one more thing from Vittoria, which I actually thought the box was empty. <laughs> then their new light airliner, which weighs 55 grams. It's yeah, so it's light, it almost doesn't register. Mm. Uh, now that is intended for cross country and cross country trail, uh, for rims between 25 and 30 mil. Um, but with something that weighs that little, there's literally no reason to not run it. Mm. Um, you know, it gives a more progressive action to the tyre, gives support and it's got profile that sits into the rim. Uh, but yeah, all good stuff from Victoria. Okay, quiz time now. We've got three questions coming at you on the screen. First question, what does TPI stand for when referring to tyres? Next question is name four MTB brands that are named after places. Ooh. Um, the AMP Research B1 famously used the Horst link, but which major manufacturer patented the design under a different name? We'll pick up the answers a bit later. Okay, into comments from last week's show, which was a bit of a random show. It's a collection of some of the best bits from Eurobike and all of the additional stuff we shot. Mm. Uh, so we're going to dive straight in, and one of the first comments says, I don't understand why GMBN is forcing an idea that SRAM did something big by making a rear derailleur on an axle mount. It's an old patent and not theirs. Blah, 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 blah. And he's referenced, um, or oh, they've referenced, Shimano Saint first generation mounted on axle. Yeah, exactly, where is that now? Uh, but also, you've got to bear in mind that that patent was nothing like the patent that SRAM put in. And actually, SRAM played probably the ultimate game in the bike industry by convincing everyone to use the UDH by making it open source, which is actually a really good idea by getting rid of that hanger, um, and then bringing out a derailleur that fits exclusively to that. Now, seeing as you've been looking at patents, you might have noticed if you've actually dived in that there are some other manufacturers making stuff that's going to be hanging on those UDH hangers and on that direct mount system. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Mm. So we're not forcing an idea, we just accept it's no. a very good idea. It's a very good idea. Uh, McLaren44 says, Toff in charge of links makes sense. Why we never get them now, Toff. Oh, Toff, come on. Sickest thing of the week, Toff. Come on, super uh, sick, Toff. Sort it out. Um, Clark have been doing bench top parts washer for years. They're about 60 quid. Thank I you very much. I did not know that. I'm going to get one because, yeah, I've only ever seen full-size parts washers. Hey, I must be living under a rock. But thanks. Thanks I for the tip it. off. I love it yeah. when people do that. Um, so Holly is R says the titanium full suspension at the Trick Stuff booth is Hoon Cycles. Yeah, I know. I know it's the it more is. Hoon, you naughty do, do, boy. Do you know what? Like Matt even corrected me at the time, and I was like, oh god, it is. Yeah. But for some reason, we just didn't reshoot that bit. Kingdom. We were literally, you know what shows are like, literally buzzing around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I'm sorry. I yeah. did know that, should have known better. Slapped wrist for you. There you go. There you go. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do check out Hoon Cycles there, because they're yeah, absolutely they are, stunning. If, here's a shot on screen, actually, yeah. just to show you the actual bike without the bike packing bags. Absolutely stunning. Yeah. So nice with that hover shock and the intent fork. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, so I'm sorry. Uh, next up, once you get um oh, once you get a light carbon frame on a modern e-bike with automatic gearbox, ABS brake system, flight attendant, and all that stuff, are you actually riding the bike? <laughs> I See bet, where you're coming I from. I bet this guy drives an automatic vehicle. Ah, <laughs> uh, do you? <laughs> yeah, I bet. Uh, so typical guy 84 says uh, no to ABS. It came into the mo motorcycle world and the benefits are fantastic for safety. Mm -hmm. well, that sounds like a reason to adopt it. Anyway, yeah. uh, mountain biking is all about personal skill and feeling the terrain. Uh, same could be said and has been said for motorcycle racing. I just feel it doesn't belong. But you like it on motorcycles. But and you also won't... say it's, it's about personal safety. skill and feeling the terrain. Yeah, why don't you Do you, you ride a rigid bike? The... <laughs> Come on, Feel the terrain on your motorbike as well. It's certainly not tech that's going to go everywhere. <laughs> no. Yeah, obviously, because it has got limitations because you've got to have a battery and all the other stuff with it. Yeah. But it is phenomenal. It offers an amazing thing and it will be very good for some people. I that's reserve okay. judgment until I've ridden yeah. it. Um, but yeah, I don't think we're going to be seeing that on every bike. I won't be putting it on my bike, said Ari. But I think it's, it's, it's cool very tech. cool. 
OK, it's rewind time, so I better pass it over to you because I've got no idea what's going on on this old tat. OK, so <laughs> first one is, well, actually, this is just a shot of a catalogue for uh, Manitou for 19 99 for wow. an expert owner's manual. That's kind of cool, isn't it? It is in a bad cool, way. yeah, it is cool. Um, but it's the just bike, a piece of paper. Right, so the bike is, yeah, it's just a piece of paper. So <laughs> this is a Marin. This one is a Wildcat Trail. Um, in these, in this sort of era, all Marin bikes kind of shared the same outline. A little bit like orange kind of do, you know. Bikes are all actually different, but the same sort of silhouette. Um, twin crown fork, a Zonic shorty stem, which is actually comical because it's really long, but back then that was a short <laughs> stem. Single pivot with a Fox shock on there. It's, it's a cool old bike and it is quite nice to see and they weren't bad either at the time. They worked well, they were affordable, they had decent suspension units. Well, no, the, is no this, the hub. Are these is this? downhill forks, is that? What they um, would have been no, it, was kind of, it would day? actually be like a, a trail fork. Really? Yeah, it was about five inch travel. I mean, it wasn't a downhill bike, so you could say yeah. all mountain trail free ride, yeah. if that's the thing. And that one was bought from single track bikes, which I'm not sure even exist anymore. Marin? Marin? Marin. It's Marin, Marin? County. <laughs> but if you're from the UK, it's obviously Marin. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a lovely old bike. And also on the upper parts of the fort legs, it's got the hard knocks stanchion protectors. I mean, that was just the era you felt the need to just put random stuff on your bikes and your knee pads and shin pads used to be made for neoprene and they used to smell like vinegar after a oh, ride. They, yeah. they were just I a very, yeah, they those, were just, yeah. oh, just the worst. So thankfully we've moved on from those times, mm. but very nice to see. I don't know who's uploaded this because no one's put any details, but it's a very nice bike. Thanks for sending it in. But the next one is, flipping out how many images. This one is from Mark. And it's my all-time favourite mountain bike frame. So, really? Yeah, well, this, this one's under the guise of the Mongoose Amplifier from 1993, uh, but it's ac actually called an Amp Research B2. That's the frame that's underneath this. And it's got the McPherson strut suspension design on there. It's got the horse light and the four bar. In fact, this is one of the first bikes to have the proper four bar. This was designed and built by Horse Lightner. Um, and he kind of got a bit bored waiting for Specialized because he was working with them on stuff. Mm. And he, he put this bike out. Um, and he, he designed his own fork because I think he got impatient because there wasn't enough good suspension forks. So he's like, oh, I'll make one of those as well. And he put this whole bike out. And that what you can't see from here is it's a twin down tube. And oh. it's just, it's so sleek and snap. I mean, they all snapped. <laughs> you know, it wasn't. <laughs> so the suspension sleek. worked great, but it was, uh, it had some flaws. And the spin wheels, which I never liked them, but they were kind of cool as well. They were like highly desirable, but I, I like spoked wheels. And this explains why you like that DVA XC Pro type now. It's not far off, really, mm, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. It's, it's not a million I'm sure miles Chris off. would love me saying that, yeah. a designer. But, hey, uh, oh, come on, it's flattery, <laughs> isn't it? And all that stuff. Uh, thanks for sending them in. And oh man, I, I have got an amp frame hanging up at home that I will one day, maybe never, perhaps do something with it. But Ooh. yeah, there we go. Keep sending stuff in to the link down there. Thank you. Okay, time for some quiz answers. Uh, first one, uh, what does TPI stand for when referring to tyres? It's threads per inch. Not um, treads per inch. It could be treads <laughs> per inch. Uh, typically you get 60 and 120 on mountain bike tyres. Um, and you might think by having 60 you're going to get like holes between them, but it's essentially the threads are just thicker and they're packed tightly together, which is why downhill tyres tend to be 60 and more like XC or trail tyres tend to be 120 because they're supple and finer rather than big and thick. Yeah, more isn't better, it's just mm. different. Uh, so four NTB brands that are named after places, you could have had Santa Cruz, Marin, not Marin, or Marin. Uh, Rocky <laughs> Mountain and Kona, although Kona. we're not quite sure if Kona was named after a place, but it is a place. It certainly is. Um, and if there's any others, let us know down there. I mean, there's a lot of bike it's brands out be. there, but yeah, I'm yeah. sure I'm sure there are some we missed, but hey, that's definitely four, four loads good of models, but I don't know about brands. It's got to be brands, I yeah, think. It's yeah, it's got to be brands, definitely. Lot, lots of them are named after people, mm. um, but yeah, maybe we'll pick up the people brands one next. Um, the Amp Research, Amp Research B1, famously used the horse link. We just showed you one of those in Rewind, uh, but which major manufacturer patented the design under a different name? It was specialised. So Specialized, in fact, Horse Lightner, as I said in Rewind, actually designed a bike for Specialized, but they spent so long sort of figuring out what they were going to do with it that he got bored waiting and made his own one. Um, and they were so impressed with how the suspension worked that they licensed the Horse Link, which is on the chainstay there. Uh, that's what makes the bike a true four bar. And they painted it as the FSR Link. And I can't remember when they started it, but that patent ran out in 2014. But up until that date, 
any manufacturer pretty much that was using it, uh, unless you got over it by manufacturing a bike in a specific place, had to pay a licensing fee to Specialized. And then got to 2014, and then everyone started yeah, having everyone. four bars. <laughs> and all the, all the companies that had single pivots with a linkage on the seat stay instead of on the chain stay, magically turned them into four bars. Because As you would. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite nice. And it's, it's one of the oldest systems, and it's on, it's on that canyon there, it's on that canyon there. It's on <laughs> so many bikes today because it's brilliant. Mm. Well, that's all we've got time for today. And I guess, well, join in the debate in the comments if you want to stick around for a bit down below. And we're talking about that downhill pivot prototype and whether we think it is paving the way in downhill and whether you would ride a bike with two chains. Two chains? Yeah. Anyway, let us know down in the comments below. Bye for now.